This week, I took a tour of the European Space Operations Center in Germany ahead of the launch of the new Solar Orbiter spacecraft. The mission not only hopes to discover fascinating new information about the polar regions of the Sun, but also potentially into how solar flares and ejections occur. My name is Daniel Fasharen. I'm a scientist at University College London's Mollard Space Science Laboratory. Um, I'm a lecturer in space plasma physics. I'm involved in the Solar Orbiter mission as a co-investigator of the Solar Wind Plasma Analyzer Instrument. Now we saw a lot of your presentation this morning, uh, which was very fascinating. And what do you think is going to be the most important thing about what we might find out with the Solar Orbiter? There are two great things about Solar Orbiter that are really new and that we are very excited about. One thing is that it's a combination of instruments that actually look at the sun from the distance. So we have telescopes that observe in different wavelengths. And we have instruments on the spacecraft that measure what happens around the spacecraft. So we measure the solar wind, the magnetic and electric fields. And we can really, with Solar Orbiter, combine these two sources of information to find out about the sun and the solar wind. So this is the one advantage. And the second one is that the spacecraft will leave the plane of the ecliptic so we will kind of like leave the plane where all the planets move around and we get a different vantage point to see the poles of the sun. And the poles of the sun are really important for our understanding of the physics of the heavens. Do you have any idea what we might find at the poles? Yeah, so one thing that's funny about the sun is that it rotates um, faster at the equator than it does at the poles, right? So one rotation at the equator takes approximately 25 days and one rotation at the pole takes something like 35, 36 days. And that means there is like a, a shear flow in the velocity of the sun, right? And of course you want to see what happens there at the top. Another thing that we want to see at the poles is um, these are the regions where, especially during a time of low solar activity, the magnetic field opens up into space. Uh, and so we want to understand these source regions of the magnetic field that are also then the source regions of most of the solar winds during those times. Now this mission is going to go on for several years and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when we get more solar activity. Yes. Is the spacecraft under any risk of the actual sun itself producing flares that might affect it when it goes by? That's a very good point, right? It's a spacecraft that wants to understand space weather, but of course it's also prone to the space weather where it is. Uh, and like all spacecraft, yes, there is a risk that comes with it. So if there is a really huge and strong event, it can actually be problematic for the mission. Of course, like all space missions, we count for this in the design, so they have hardened components that should survive these things, but you are never completely safe. <laughs> and finally, when it comes to weather or space weather surrounding Earth, what do you think is going to be the most interesting finding when we investigate? Okay, so for space weather, the really big problem is that we are very much behind. If you compare what we know about space weather and how well our predictions work with the quality of our normal weather predictions here on Earth, we estimate that we are about 40 years behind uh, in the understanding. And so the orbiter is, is not really a space weather mission in the sense that it has operational capabilities for space weather predictions, but it's a mission for the science behind space weather. Because the more you understand the physics behind space weather, the better your predictive models will be, and the better you can make predictions in space weather. Daniel, thank you so much. Was it good? So, hi, I'm Thomas Olmsten. I'm a spacecraft operations engineer here at uh, the European Space Operations Center, uh, working in the area of Earth observation and mission operations. Now, we're obviously here for the, social, uh, the, the solar orbiter today, uh, but... Obviously, ESA and ESOC do all kinds of other things as well, and something that my audience is more familiar with as well is the meteorological satellites and all the other Earth observations. So, what do you have any uh, personal favorites when it comes to that? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, I actually work on a, a spacecraft called EarthCare, which is uh, going to launch soon, and uh, we're looking at the Earth's radiative balance with Earth care, so the greenhouse effect basically, and we're trying to look at that um, in a lot more detail than we've ever done before, particularly with different ways of looking at it. So, um, of course, I love my own spacecraft the most. Uh, <laughs> the way we look at it, though, we have uh, a Doppler radar on board uh, that can measure water droplets and their motion beneath the satellite, a very big um, LIDAR, so a laser, laser version of a radar 
uh, which can measure the aerosols and their motion and composition beneath the satellite, an imager, and a radiometer that sees how much heat is, so sort of how much infrared radiation is coming off the planet. So we know how much is going in, and with that, you can create these 3D scenes of what's happening in the entire weather and atmospheric system in the in the column beneath the satellite. So that's that really useful uh, for. Well, for weather models, because that's a big unknown at the moment, is, uh, or at least an area where we need more study, is that interaction um, between the infrared coming in uh, and how it interacts with clouds, with aerosols and things like that. So that's certainly, it's got to be my favourite because it's my <laughs> mission, but uh, it's a bit of a cheat. It certainly sounds rather groundbreaking, that particular mission. Um, yes. Has it has, have things accelerated a lot in terms of research and development in recent years? Yes, yeah, no, they have very much. I mean, um, I've noticed it since I've been at ESA. I've been here for 15 years now, and I've really noticed a big boom in Earth observation. Obviously, there's very good, um, not particularly happy reasons why the Earth is suddenly becoming a big focus of everything at the moment, but. Uh, it's certainly important that we get the data about what's happening to our planet, what's happening to our climate, what's happening in, in weather as well. Uh, and also our technology has expanded to the point where we can do more and more. So uh, our sister mission, Aeolus, uh, also has a very big LIDAR on it and uh, they use that to measure upper atmosphere wind speeds um, beneath the spacecraft, uh, just as a test to see if we could do that from space. And it took very many years to work out that we could make it happen. Um, it was technology that was completely groundbreaking and now it's flying and we're proving that that can be done. And in fact, we're massively improving on the data that's currently gathered by weather balloons all over the world. And uh, the aim will be to fly an operational constellation of these one day in the future. I think what we learned this morning more than anything through the uh, discussions that we've had is that it takes a huge amount of planning to get these things off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say with, with regards to that. Yeah, no, I mean, um, planning is everything here and um, planning for the science, planning for the operations, um, planning to make it successful. Once something's launched, we don't have a chance to go back and fix something or tweak something, and we want to maximize the mission. So, indeed, a large chunk, if not most, of our work is, is theoretical, thinking about all the things that could go wrong, for example, with a satellite, um, and how we would make sure that that didn't actually affect anything. So, uh, um, we do a lot of preparation for the worst case. If we prepare for the worst case, then the best case is easy. That's the theory, anyway. And we were chatting earlier about, um, I think we should give a mention to the uh, incoming issue that is space debris yeah. and how that is starting to become a problem out there. Yes, no, it is uh, becoming a problem. It's been coming for some time and we notice it, particularly our Earth observation satellites tend to orbit uh, between 400 and 800 kilometers above the Earth, which is one of the most populated and also therefore most polluted orbits. Uh, and this is now has become routine day-to-day -day work for us, avoiding collisions. Um, it's something that becomes normal, that we train for, uh, but there are limits to what we can do, and that's why mitigating space debris is absolutely crucial, because there'll come a point where we can't, that, that we just can't avoid anything, and then we will need space traffic management, which is not something we can do alone, everyone has to agree to it, uh, and we need to be good users of space as well. Do you think that's going to become mainstream and very well known about in the next 10 years then ways to stop this from happening more than yes, anything else. And I mean it has already started becoming mainstream that we try and do something to stop space debris so we already have international guidelines now that the most easy and famous of which is if you launch something 25 years after its end of mission it should come back down to earth. That's a, a fairly simple guideline to apply. Unfortunately, it's not universally applied yet, but that will help keep space debris under control. Um, we stick by that, um, but it's important that we do that. We also, though, need to start going and getting stuff because it's no longer good enough to just be good users of space. We need to clean up after ourselves, and we can't go and catch every little tiny chunk, but there are some big satellites out there that we can go and grab and bring back down to earth that'll greatly improve the situation.